Well, everybody, good evening. Thanks so very much for being here. I'm Dr. David Morwood. Today we're going to talk about office procedures, things like Botox, fillers, injectables, mini lips, procedures that we can do in the office. We started this series a few years ago, uh, calling it the truth about plastic surgery. We started doing this for people in the beauty industry, and then we expanded it for the general public, basically due to popular demand. So I appreciate everybody coming. What I'm going to do tonight is show lots of before and after pictures. My patients, they've all given us permission to use their images for teaching. Unless I tell you otherwise, they're my, um, they're my patients, except for the celebrities. The celebrities will be pretty obvious. I'm just using some of them to make certain points about what is attractive and what is not attractive, etc. Um, and I'm going to tell the truth as I see it. This is a, a personal approach uh, based on my practice after years of experience. And it's pretty informal, so if you have questions, about something that I say, please let me know, or if something's not clear, let me know. But there'll be time afterwards for questions, and then we can go back upstairs and have more treats, okay? So tonight we're going to talk about, essentially, office procedures. So what can we do in the office? First of all, we can do skin care, skin rejuvenation, Botox, fillers and fat, and mini lifts, short operations, and, and some limited areas of liposuction. Um, oftentimes I'm asked, do you call it plastic surgery because you use a lot of plastic or silicone in your practice? Uh, uh, actually, the same root in Greek, plastikos, means to mold, shape, and tailor. That's why we call it plastic surgery, because that's what we do. Um, some people come in and say, Dr. Gordon, you know, I know you go overseas and do missions and you take care of a lot of serious accidents and people with cancer, etc., and they feel kind of vain to be asking about aesthetic surgery. Actually, it's normal, natural, healthy to be concerned about your appearance. That's normal human nature. If we see somebody on the street who's not concerned about their appearance, we recognize that as kind of odd. And of course, the face is a very powerful tool of communication. The way we communicate, and of course, this is studied by plastic surgeons and sociologists, primarily with our voice, of course, but our face and eyes convey a tremendous amount of emotion and information. And some of us, depending upon our ethnicity, use our limbs more than others. And of course, body language is very important. But number one is voice. Number two are the face and the eyes. Now, when we talk about signs of aging and sun exposure and effects of gravity, etc., some of those changes are quite predictable. And just about everyone here could at least recognize someone who is older and younger and almost specify their, their decade. Um, some signs of aging, however, are not consistent and hard to predict, and of course, everyone ages differently. Now, in consultation, what we need to do is provide an individual customized approach, and I think good, high-quality plastic surgery really is dependent upon an accurate and good knowledge of the anatomy, and we like to go step by step. First of all, of course, there are signs of aging in the skin. Uh, the fat is very important, especially in the face and in the hands. As we tend to mature and as time goes by, we lose fat in our face and in our hands and we tend to gain weight in our trunk. It's kind of a, it's kind of a bad trick, not an unfunny trick. Of course, the fascia, which is the connective tissue, uh, tends to lose its resilience and there's some laxity. The muscle, there's less tone and mass. The cartilage, there's a loss of resilience. And sometimes, actually, certain cartilages can get larger, for example, in the nose and the ears. As we mature, the nose and the ears can actually get larger. And the bone, there can be some volume loss. As I said before, many of the signs of aging are predictable, but we still need to have a customized approach. And in fact, in my practice, this is one of the most important take-home lessons, that every patient deserves a custom, custom design approach. You know, you go on the internet, you see these advertisements on television, etc., that there's this certain magic lift and this certain lift, etc., where people get in line and everybody gets the same thing. I think for high quality, safe, effective plastic surgery, aesthetic surgery, custom designed approach is really important. Now, when we talk about facial rejuvenation, I think we need to look at the pyramid or the triangle because there are three essential elements that we need to focus on. Number one, we need to look at the skin. And skin care is very important. And skin rejuvenation procedures that I talk about is very important. Number two, volume replacement is very important. I'm going to talk about fillers. I'm going to talk about fat grafting, etc. As we mature, as I said, we tend to lose fat in our face and in our hands, and we tend to put on weight in our trunk. Now, 
Let's talk about, uh, oh, well, of course, before I go on, of course, perhaps the most powerful in the triad, of course, is surgery, and that's surgical repositioning of the soft tissues. Things like mini lifts, eyelid surgery, neck lift, etc. So again, there's three essential components. We look at the skin, we look at the volume, and we look at surgical repositioning. Now, what I'd like to do is talk about skin care because I think it's very important. Things like acne, hyperpigmentation, wrinkles, unevenness, skin that lacks a certain attractiveness or a certain sheen. Now, as I said, we need to start with an accurate knowledge and good, if good detailed knowledge of the anatomy. There's the epidermis that we see, and it's important that you recognize that the very top layer of the epidermis is not, not living, it's the keratin layer, it's like nails and hair. And if that layer gets too thick, even though it's a moisture barrier and can protect the skin, if it gets too thick, the skin loses its sheen and it loses kind of a brightness. It can take on kind of a dull appearance. Now, under the epidermis is the dermis. That's where the blood supply is, that's where the collagen is, that's where the strength is. Under there, there's the subcutaneous tissue. Then the fascia is on top of the muscle, either in the fat or right up on top of the muscle. There's the periosteum, which is the bone lining, and then there's the bone itself. Now, anyone who lives in California is probably an outdoors person, and we all love the sun. However, the UV rays within the sun are not our friend. As I said, uh, the epidermis is on top of the dermis, and what happens is, with chronic sun exposure, there's something called photoaging, dermoelastosis, the skin becomes atrophic, dispigmented, you know, you can get irregular patches, liver spots, age spots, etc., wrinkled, unelastic, and leathery. Now, where do we see this? We see this only on skin that's exposed to the sun, face, neck, chest, hands, and arms. Here's a fascinating photo, not my patient, but this has been sent around in plastic surgery circles. Here's a truck driver, a professional driver. He's been driving for about 40 years. And on the, past, on the window side, look at the signs of aging on that left side because of the sun, sun and wind exposure. On the other side, it's uh, reasonably or more youthful looking. And I think that's important because most of the people who come in my office will notice this about their face, but they're not aware of it of why that is. It's people who drive get exposed to a lot more sun and wind and drying effect on the left side as opposed to the right side. Now, uh, I talked about those signs of photoaging. What plastic surgeons and dermatologists can do, we can actually take biopsies of the skin and see under the microscope signs of that chronic photoaging and photo uh, and sun exposure. And we, I don't want to go through all of this slide, but I want to show you an example because this can be studied histologically. We can actually look under the microscope and see. Here is some, a skin biopsy of an area of skin that has not been exposed to a lot of sun. And here's a biopsy in that same person in an area that has been exposed to the sun. See, there's some of that dispigmentation, the so-called hyperpigmentation or liver spot, sunspot, age spot, and the collagen is more disorderly and there's less of it. Now, if you see an esthetician or a dermatologist or plastic surgeon, you're likely to get categorized according to your skin type. We shorten this Fitzpatrick and Globo classification. We just call this the Fitzpat classification. Essentially, it depends upon your reaction to the sun. For people from northern Scandinavia and northern Europe, they never tan, they always burn. That's type two, all the way to African skin that never burns. It's very dark brown or black skin. Most people are somewhere in between, two through five. But it's very important to get categorized. And also, it's important to have your skin analyzed in terms of dryness, where do you need to add moisture, where it's thick, where it's thin, dispigmentation, acne, fine lines, etc. So, let's talk about cosmetic non-invasive treatments. I'm a big believer in estheticians and getting facials and doing proper skin care. What we like to describe is good dental care, right? You see the dentist six to every six to 12 months or three times a year for cleaning, et cetera. That's like getting a facial. And you do a whole, you do a whole program of care, right? Flossing and brushing, et cetera. Just like your skin. I think everybody needs good dental care. Everybody needs good skin care if you live in California. Microdermabrasion. I think that can be helpful. Fruit acid and light peels from an esthetician. Intense pulse light, that can be helpful. Now, I put radio frequency and external ultrasound in parentheses 
I think those are relatively experimental new treatments. It's not clear who benefits and who doesn't benefit, but I do want to list them. Now, what about some cosmetic invasive treatments? Everybody's heard of Botox, it's a muscle relaxant, I'm going to spend some time on that. Dysport's the same chemical, just a little different carrier. Fillers, things like Juvederm, Collagen, um, Restylane, etc. They can be very helpful. Now, peels, I like TCA peels, trichloroacetic acid peels, and I'm going to show some of those later. Ablative lasers like CO2, dermabrasion, which is essentially a type of controlled surgical sanding. Now, sclerotherapy was injecting veins. Now, just briefly, skincare essentials. Number one, if there's one thing that I can teach patients about, it's avoiding sun. Everybody loves the feeling of being so warm and feeling all those rays, but it's not great. The UV light, the UV rays does plays havoc with the collagen and the dermis. Number two, we need to properly cleanse our skin. You need to learn about if you have oily areas or dry areas. Exfoliation. Remember I talked about how that very top layer of epidermis is not living? We need, to, we need to thin out that layer, which leads us to the next number four is restoration. We need to kind of churn up the factory cells in the germinal matrix and the basal layer to really make a lot of cells, make new collagen and lay and increase the deposition of baby cells. Now before I go on to moisturizing, I want to make one point. It takes about 30 days for a baby cell to get from the germinal matrix or the, that factory, factory layer up to the top where you can see it. So sometimes I hear people say, oh, you know, I tried skincare for two weeks and it hasn't helped me. You haven't even given your, the new baby cells an opportunity to get to, the, to get to where you can see them, even one, even one shedding, even one layer. So just imagine if you do that for six or eight months, that's six or eight cycles. So we've got to hang in there with skincare, and it can be very helpful. Moisturizing is very important, especially around the eyes and around the mouth. Oftentimes people think they have crepey skin and fine lines. It's really dried out skin, which needs moisture. And, of course, last but not least, avoiding smoking. Everybody's familiar with antioxidants. That's very hot now in, in food circles, and this juice, and this food has tons of antioxidants. Well, the oxidants is almost like rusting skin. One puff of cigarette smoke has thousands of oxidants. So if you can avoid the sun and avoid smoking, uh, that's half the battle and these other things are really very important. Now, I talked about the epidermis is what we see, but the dermis underneath there is really the important building uh, block area where the collagen is. Collagen is the main building block protein in our body. There are some things that we can do that actually increases collagen and help improve the health of the skin. And this is biopsy proven. Some retinoic, some retinoic acids, you've heard of uh, Retin-A. Uh, vitamin C treatments can help, some CO2 lasers and some fillers. I want to spend a, more time about fillers later, but just keep in mind that most of the fillers we use today are, are comprised of hyaluronic acids. Hyaluronic acid is a natural substance found in our skin, it holds about a thousand to a hundred thousand times its own molecular weight in water. So it helps us to have vibrant, youthful, moisturized, uh, water-retaining skin. That's hyaluronic acid. Very important. Not only collagen, but hyaluronic acids. Now, for example, this is a very busy slide, but I said that vitamin C treatments are one way to stimulate rejuvenation of the skin, stimulates collagen synthesis, etc. It can actually, um, actually result when we do biopsies to less damage and, and healthier looking skin. Now, how, how is it that the um, vitamin C in some of these preparations work? Well, it increases collagen, increases cell regeneration, decreases the melanin production, for example, for age spots, liver spots, so it really can help. Now, for example, here's a skin biopsy in an area with some sun damage. Look at that thick keratin layer. It kind of takes away the bright sheen of the skin and the, that, that collagen layer and dermal layer is not very thick. After about six months of skin care, then we see a much thicker, more or orderly collagen layer, more cells, thinner keratin layer, etc. Now, skin's important, it's, uh, the skin texture and what we see the surface is very important, but it's not the end all be all, but it's certainly important. I do want to show you an example of what some lasers can do and what they can't do. It's very important that we 
Keep in mind the triangle. It's very important when we look at those three different areas, skin care, skin rejuvenation, volume, and surgical repositioning. It's very important that we don't intermingle them. One of the things I want you to learn this evening, besides everybody deserves a custom designed approach, is that we need to target our therapy, target our rejuvenation towards what the problem is, what the issue is. So for example, and again, I'm not against lasers. I think they can be helpful. But if we look at this slide uh, critically, a friend of mine lent me this slide, the before and after from a certain type of uh, fractional CO2 laser. Certainly there's fewer fine lines, certainly the texture and the sheen of the skin is improved, but there's not firmer, tighter skin, the skin has not been distributed or redistributed or suspended, etc. So lasers have their place, the heat has a role. But if someone wants and needs a facelift, or a mini lift, or an eyelid tuck, et cetera, or a neck lift, and they think if they get a laser, they're gonna get that same result, I think it's more likely that that person will be probably less than enthusiastically delighted, or delightful, or delighted. So we've gotta uh, target our therapy. Now, just as an example, the heat, uh, with, with a laser, the, the, the energy that a laser transfers essentially is a heat delivered control the weight of the skin. Now, most people are familiar with bacon coming out of a package. It's moist and supple, right? You can bend it, you can almost tie a knot. When we heat it, yes, it shrinks. Of course it shrinks, but it also gets brittle and you can break it. So, and what, what I'm advocating, what we're advocating is supple, soft, moist skin that is holding, holding lots of water, those hyaluronic acids. So, what I want to make a point is that the cosmetic treatments, things like laser, some TCA peels, do not remove extra skin or dramatically tighten loose skin. They do affect the texture of the skin, but they do not remove extra skin or dramatically tighten loose skin. And the converse is true, that the plastic surgeon, I cannot operate away wrinkles. Okay, so we've got to think of the triangle, we've got to think of the pyramid, we're looking at the skin, we need to look at the volume, and we need to, we need to look at repositioning the soft tissues. Now, before I show this next slide of a young girl who doesn't need plastic surgery or skin care or anything, when you schedule a consultation, and I hope you all do, uh, we're going to ask you to bring in pictures from decades gone by or uh, a time when you think that you had better skin or your soft tissue was repositioned, was positioned in a better place. Because I love to study the aging face, and as time goes by, I love to see the change in the skin, and fat compartments, etc. So this gal brought this picture in, and here she is about 40 years later walking into my office. So less volume, lax tissue, some sun exposure. Now she underwent some volume restoration, she underwent some skin care. Uh, skin treatment and, and conservative surgical repositioning. So there she is about six weeks later. Now, my wonderful staff have uh, taught me or warned me or foretold me that not everybody who comes to these seminars are accustomed to seeing people in the immediate post-op period. So I just want to let you know. What the slide I'm about to show shows so this. This is about six weeks post-op or eight weeks post-op. The next slide I'm going to show is the same woman about one week post-op, okay? So she's undergone some surgical repositioning and some skin care, some dermabrasion, and a TCA peel and surgical repositioning. And then, so what happens with the TCA peel is nothing happens for about four or five days. And then for four or five days, the skin rapidly exfoliates for four or five days, and then you're left with fresher, smoother, more vibrant skin. Okay, that's a TCA peel. Now, uh, I want to show you some of these examples because I like TCA peels. I think they're very valuable, can be very helpful in the right patient. Now, when we look at this gal, keep in mind the triangle because when, you, when, we, when we do the consultation, we're going to look at the skin, we're going to look at the, your need for surgical repositioning, or not, or not need, and we're going to look at volume. So if you look at her, you can almost say it's like a, it's like a tight balloon with a little air let, let out of it. She's a little sagging and the gravity has pulled down. So, conservative surgical repositioning with a little volume with a TCA peel. So here she is about, that's about eight days later. And there she is at about six weeks. So do you see the difference? 
a little surgical repositioning, a little volume, and treating the skin. Now, to me, she doesn't look over, over pulled. She doesn't look fake, but she looks more rejuvenated. So this is taking a conservative, judicious approach, keeping in mind the three different parts of the triangle. So that's a TCA peel. So again, I do want to show you some more examples of TCA peels. Here's a gal, I don't want to bore you, but, but for example, she's got some dispigmentation, a lack of sheen. Here she is after about eight days. And here she is after about six weeks, just a little brighter skin. Okay, that's a finishing peel, TCA, trichloroacetic acid. Most of my patients really like it. Now, what about perioral rejuvenation? Some women come in and they say to me, even though I don't smoke or even though I don't use a straw a lot, they have sort of smoker's lines, cigarette lines. Uh, we need to look at the lines, of course. We need to look at the proportion and the volume. In most Caucasians, the ideal lip proportion from the upper lip to lower lip is one to two. Uh, for most dark, dark skinned Hispanics or Africans, it's more like one to one. So we need to, need to look at the overall face, the volume, proportion, as I said, and the lines. So what about the perioral lines? No smoking, avoid sun. We need to look at volume. Sometimes a person's own fat, and I'm going to talk about fat graphs in, in, later on. Botox, I'm very judicious, very careful with Botox around the lips. I don't like to change people's smiles. I don't like it when people come back and say, you know, I look better, but it feels funny when I eat or talk. I think the trade-off is not favorable, so I'm very, very judicious in the perioral area around the mouth. I do like it in the neck, I love it around the eyes, and we're going to come back to that. Okay, so dermabrasion, ablative lasers, and a deeper peel can help. So what are we trying to do with those smoker's lines? If you, in, in dermabrasion and things like that. Well, if you imagine the mountain or a hill next to a valley, we can either fill up the valley, or we can take the hill or mountain down just a little bit. So essentially that's what we're doing with fillers and fat and dermabrasion. We want to help smooth things out. Now, here's a woman, I just want to show you some examples. She has relatively, oh I'd say mild to moderate perioral lines. And here she is with some of that, some of that treatment, just smoothing out the lines with little volume, little surface treatment, etc. Now, here's a gal who had a little conservative uh, surgery and some volumizing and topical treatment to improve the perioral lines. Starting to get the idea? So here's another gal with some perioral lines. And see those more deep, those deeper crevices? She looks kind of deflated, don't you think? So we need to revolumize, very conservative repositioning of the tissues and resurfacing. And there she is. So before I go on to Botox, what I want to talk about is a little bit more is volumetric rejuvenation. I'll, I'm going to show you some slides about the grape and raisin principle, but for now keep in mind that perhaps the older way or traditional way of facial rejuvenation is to do a kind of facelift where you make an incision and you pull so hard that the wrinkles come out and then you sew up. That tends to kind of flatten faces. What we want to do is do volumetric restoration, right? We want attractive, healthy faces in men and women to project, right? High cheekbones, well-defined arches, a projecting, projecting chin and jaw in both men and women, okay? So that's more of a volumetric uh, treatment for facial rejuvenation. Okay, so we talked about skin and a little bit about volume. I'll come back to volume later. Now, everybody's heard about Botox. Um, it's, there's a lot of sort of magic and myths in the literature, popular literature and in the internet. Botox is a muscle relaxant. It's a medical treatment, it's a medical surgical treatment for muscle spasm and muscle motion. I first did Botox on children um, when I was a fellow in microsurgery, pediatric, pediatric plastic surgery at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles for facial asymmetry in children. I think it's really effective and I think it's safe when someone who has train, training uses it. It's good for fine lines, it's great for furrows of the glabella. We can do some conservative facial sculpting and of course can help restore facial symmetry. As I said, it's a treatment for any muscle spasm. I use it sometimes for spastic paralysis of the hand. There's something called the spastic man syndrome. Uh, it has many medical and surgical uses. It's a muscle relaxant. I think one of the first medical uses for it was for children with Esotropia and cross eyes and wall eyes, we can help rebalance the extraocular muscles. So, hyperhidrosis, it can help for people with excess sweating 
And I have a number of people who come back and tell me that it helps their migraines, especially kind of tension, muscle spasm migraines. Now, what about uh, conservative facial sculpting and shaping? For example, the brows. We know that there are muscles that depress the brows, right? And we know that there are muscles that elevate the brows. There's one major elevator of the brow that's called the frontalis muscle. There are three, three major depressors of the brow, the orbicularis oculi, the corrugator, and the procerus. If we selectively make the depressors relax, then we, and we allow the elevators to take over, we can get a very conservative brow lift, not only to minimize lines in between the brows, these glabellar lines, and fine lines around the eyes, we can do some conservative shaping. So, Botox comes in a, in a bottle, it's sterile, and we reconstitute it, we mix it right in the office. And we go through a lot of this stuff. It's great for these lines in between the eyebrows. The company calls those the 1s or the 11s or the 111s. Um, so I want to show you some examples. Here's a gal who's attractive. She works with the public. What she noticed is a lot of her colleagues and, and people, who, clients who come to her, would say, you know, you look tired. Or are, you, are you in a bad mood? Or are you upset? She's a delightful gal. Uh, she just, for some reason, was sort of intent in her concentration. So there she is on day one with the Botox, and here she is two weeks later trying to give me that same look. It takes a three or four days, or two or three days for the Botox to take effect. Maximum effect is in about two weeks, and it lasts for four to five-ish months. If you have Botox three or four times, those muscles don't seem to ever return to their original strength. I think it's very effective, and it works well for guys. Here's a guy who wanted to diminish the fine lines at the side and diminish that, that ones, those ones in between the brows. So it works well for him. Now, he didn't listen to me when I told him to stay out of the sun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, guys will be guys. So here's a gal who uh, just didn't like that. She just always seems to be always concentrating or concentrates hard or look of discernment. After Botox, here she is and with a little bit of elevation. Now, can I go back? If you look at her brows here, and then look at her brows after, after about two weeks after Botox, not only are the lines minimized, but she got a little bit of lift out of it. Not as much as a surgical brow lift, but a conservative lift for a relatively young person can be helpful. Now, here's a gal with a similar thing. Uh, she got help in her forehead and in the glabella with the Botox. Now, what about I mentioned that I like it in the neck. For early platysmal banding, uh, so, so those cords that people come in with, uh, and they think it's tight skin, it's really the tight muscle. So if we can get that platysmal muscle to relax, the muscles just fall back, and people, men and women, can get a crisper, cleaner neckline. So if we look at that muscle as this part of the triangle, if we get that to relax and fall backwards, it improves the cervical mental angle. So here's that same woman about three weeks after the Botox. Okay? So I really like it for the periorbital area. We can do some conservative shaping. I like it in the, for the lower third of the face, but very judicious around the mouth. Okay, so we talked about some skin care, the TCA peels. We talked about Botox. Later on, I'll talk about surgery. What about volume replacement? I've said this before, as we tend to mature, we lose fat in our hands and our face and we gain weight in our trunk. What a bad trick. So, there are two big categories of volume items, fillers and a person's own fat. You know, it seems like about every month there's a new filler. There's some broad categories. Hyaluronic acids are the most commonly used fillers. There's a calcium-based filler. Maybe you've, maybe you've heard of Radius. We tend to use that almost as liquid bone. And there's, there's different uh, types of fillers for thin skin, thick skin, etc. if we're going to put it down deep. So fillers can fill lines, plumps of, plumps of tissue, and non-surgical facial sculpting. It comes in a sterile syringe, in a box. Excuse me. It comes in a sterile syringe in a box. We can take it off the shelf. There's some cost to it. Um, that's one of the downsides. We have to buy it. But it can be very effective, and it's done right in the office. We use ice, we use some topical cream. Some people like dental blocks where I make them numb. So for example, here's a really good looking gal with beautiful eyes that she noticed as she matured, she was losing her high cheekbones. She was losing fat in her face. 
So here she is right in the office giving her more volume on her cheekbones. See the difference? Just done right in the office with some heavy Juvederm. There's some hyaluronic acids that are very light. I use them on the eyelids. There's some we put down deep uh, on the bone like Radius or the newer Voluma, etc. Now, how do I use it for a person who might want a lower blood flow plasty, that's the eyelid tuck, but is not quite ready for surgery? Okay, remember I talked about the hill and the mountain, hill or the mountain in the valley? Well, we can either take down the hill or the mountain, or we can fill up the valley a little bit. So here's an example. We're in the office, just with filler, we help minimize those sort of pouches of the lower lids. And here she is about two weeks later. Okay, so if we use filler to kind of fill in those lines for someone who's not really ready for surgery, it can be very effective. Now, so far all of these people have been my patients. Here's a picture from a magazine, New Beauty, that featured me before. I think, actually, there's another patient of mine this month in New Beauty magazine. This is the so-called liquid facelift, done only with Botox and fillers. So you can, if you see, if you do it conservatively and you know what you're doing and you can use enough product, it can be helpful. Okay, so I talked about fillers. Those are volumizers. Now, what about fat grafting? What is fat grafting? Fat grafting is when I do a little bit of conservative liposuction, and we can do this in the office, not tons, but a conservative liposuction. Instead of discarding the fat, we can decant it or centrifuge it, keep it sterile, um, Sometimes we cleanse it and we put it in other places, in the buttocks, in the breast, in lines, on the cheekbones, to bring the chin forward, etc. So it's a person's own sort of natural filler. It brings up some, uh, a little bit of blood supply, it brings up some stem cells, and it brings up some estrogen receptors. And a lot of women that we do fat grafting for, fat grafting for, notice that they have improved skin. So, um, it's a natural filler. Now, stem cell rejuvenation, about one out of every 176 cells that we transpose when we do fat grafting is a stem cell. So I really don't advocate, my society doesn't advocate the, the use of the term stem cell facelift. But we do bring up some stem cells, and of course we bring up some estrogen receptors. Now the great brazen principle I'm going to come back to later. Well, let me just give you an introduction. We live in California, we have succulent, moist, build up grapes. If we expose them to the sun, they start to shrink. The old way, or traditional way to do facial rejuvenation, we pull real hard until the wrinkles disappear. But let's say we wanted to re-moisturize and fill the, that raisin back up to be more like a grape. That's more of the volumetric restoration. And that's a lot about what I'm talking about with fillers with that. Now, let me show you some examples. Here's a gal, um, and again, she just looks a little bit deflated, right? So let's do conservative soft tissue repositioning with some volumizing and some good skin care. See how she looks a little more filled up? She looks a little, even a little bit wider. That's a more youthful look, right? If you think of a baby with big fat cheeks, right? All that fat and moisture. Now, fat grafting also works very well for something called submalar hollowing. Some women come in and they say they, they seem hollow right under the high cheekbones. Fat grafting works great for that. We can do it right in the office. Now, it provides volume. It, it can, we can do some conservative shaping. It's a natural filler. I talked about the stem cell rejuvenation and the grape raising principle. So here we are. Uh, if you think of the grape being succulent and the raisins kind of exposed to the sun and dried out, we want to restore volume. So that is volumetric restoration. Now, I talked about fillers, I talked about Botox, I talked about TCA peels, I talked about some use for lasers. I want to talk about office-based surgery. Okay, remember the triangle? Once again, we've got surgical soft tissue repositioning, we've got proper skin care, and we've got volume, okay? Three parts of the triangle. Okay, what about office-based surgery? A lot of people come in and they say, what can we do in the office? Or can I have a mini lift in the office? Can we do my eyelids in the office? Can we do my neck in the office, etc." So let's talk about mini lifts. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Limited incision facial lifts. Keep in mind that every client, patient, customer deserves and needs a custom designed approach. 
Um, the, I'm going to show you some examples. I'm going to show you all kinds of examples. There's a principle that I want to emphasize is that if I make an incision to gain access to the deeper tissues and structures, it tends to be smaller than if I need to reposition or remove lots of skin. Now, in all kinds of surgery, there's, we're making shorter incisions and trying to do more through shorter incisions. Remember, if you, there may be people here who had the sort of old style gallbladder operation where a big, op, big incision is made, leaving a big scar. Now, to have your gallbladder out, you get three or four little tiny band aid incisions. The same with knee arthroscopy. Well, the same with the forehead lift and certain types of plastic surgery. If all I need to do is gain access to deeper tissues, I use magnification and fiber optic lights so I can get in and do more. If I need to excise or reposition large amounts of skin, I need to make longer incisions. So, here's an example of a gal. When you look at her, uh, I hope nobody in the audience thinks that this gal needs a big, huge facelift, but she needs a mini lift. This was done in the office with a short incision. So, she just needed some surgical repositioning, some firming, some tightening. Who, who, can, get an op who can get an operation in the office? First of all, you have to be of the kind of personality makeup, and I'm not judgmental, that you can relax. You come in and you get an oral sedative, pills, usually a narcotic and something like a Benadryl, an antibiotic, and we let that soak in, then I numb up the skin, that stings, but then your skin is numb. Then I numb up the deeper tissues, and so you end up being totally, well, you end up being numb. No, once you get numbed up, people don't complain of discomfort, so you're numb, you're very mellow, but you're awake. That's what we do in the office. And later on, we'll talk about the surgery center, what we do in the surgery center, or what we can do in the hospital. So there she is. Let me show that before and after again. So we go from there to there. Get the idea? Here's another gal with just some early signs of aging around the jowls and a little bit in the neck. She undergoes a mini lift. Now here's a gal who traveled a ways to, to, me, to see me to get some filler. I said, well, you know, by the time we buy those boxes of fillers, you're going to get a longer lasting, more effective lift and rejuvenation by a mini lift done in the office. She says, you can do that right in the office? I said, yes. So uh, she got a mini lift. Started to get the idea. Here's another gal who, you know, I wouldn't do a full facelift on a, on a woman like this, but she just needs some conservative soft tissue repositioning. Here's a gal who, need, who wanted a little neck lift. So, done in the office, short scar incision, etc. Here's a gal who had a little conservative fat grafting, conservative soft tissue repositioning through a short incision, done in the office. Again, here's a gal who didn't need lots of surgery, but smaller axis incisions to kind of clean up the areas of her cheeks and jowls. Here's a gal who's good looking and she had some conservative soft tissue repositioning with some volumizing, done in the office. Okay, starting to get the idea. Mini incisions, mini lifting. Okay, so who knows that sculptor? That's from my favorite sculptor. I bet you everybody knows that's from Rodin. Okay, so we talked about skincare, we talked about volume replacement. I want to talk a little bit more about surgery, a little bit more involved surgery. I want to try to teach you the difference between procedures that we do here in the office, or the surgery center, or the hospital. In general, uh, when, a plat when I look at you in consultation, we need to look at your face in thirds. The upper third of the face, the mid face, and then the lower third of the face. So, office space surgeries. Now, who gets a procedure in the office? First of all, you have to be able to relax, and you want to have an operation while you're awake and under low. Patient tolerance. You're awake, you get oral antibiotics, usually a pain pill, a sedative, oftentimes a better drill, but we let that stuff soak in. In general, you have to have, well, you have to be in good general health. No uncontrolled medical problems, especially high blood pressure. No cardiac history, no significant diabetes or history of pulmonary problems, okay? Uh, and of course, safety first. Now, in general, people tend to get antsy after four or five hours, you know, sitting or laying down. So we do shorter procedures in the office. Now, what about the surgery center? I'm lucky that on the other side of the uh, other side of this building, we have an in-office surgery center. So, in the surgery center, we start an IV, 
and we can give you those same medicines right in the vein, a narcotic, a sedative, and an antibiotic. And you can just tell the anesthesiologist how deep you want to go. Do you want to go to sleep? Do you want to have twilight? Do you want to take a nap? Whatever it is that you want. Um, it's mandatory for most implants. Like I don't, I don't, I can modify breast implants in the office, but I don't do primary breast augmentation. If we're going to do an implant, chin implant, or something like that, I like to go to the surgery center where it's super sterile. The operatory we use here, we use lots of betadine, sterile instruments, etc. It's sterile. But if there's something called super sterile environment, we go to the surgery center or hospital. And an overnight stay is possible at the surgery center. Now, what about the hospital? For anesthesia, typically general anesthetic, certain medical conditions, if you want an overnight stay, it's either at the hospital or surgery center. And if we're going to do a combined insurance and cosmetic case, typically we take that to the hospital. Okay, so again, as I said, uh, we like to look at the face in thirds. So let's start with the upper third, around the brows, the eyelids, and I'm going to try to specify as we go. I'm going to show you some cases that we do right in the office and some cases that we do at the surgery center hospital. These signs of aging can be predictable, but one thing for sure, uh, a sign of beauty is a nice full upper lid and for women a gentle slope upward towards the ear and then either a horizontal portion or even coming down just a little bit. So again, upper. so let's talk about the upper third of the uh, face. So, what about brow and eyebrow lifts? There's many ways to do this. The old sort of traditional uh, coronal approach through a long incision. There's the temporal approach, endoscopic assisted, a little direct lift, or transpalpebral. This is more popular now. I like these where I go, if I'm going to do an upper blepharoplasty or an upper eyelid tuck, I can slip in through there and lift up the brow. Now here's just a drawing of a sort of traditional coronal approach. I don't do those very often. Here's a gal who came to me, good looking gal, good looking eyes, but she just felt like her brows were too heavy, her forehead was kind of droopy. What she needed was a brow lift through small incisions. So get the idea that she just looks more bright. Now, as I said to you before, the celebrities I'm going to show are not my patients. I wouldn't do that. I'm showing this because the brow position in a man, in our society, in European societies, we accept a much lower brow that's more horizontal. This guy, it's almost his trademark, right? It's a sign of strength and masculinity. So I'm much more conservative. I still do some eyebrow position, repositioning in men, but I'm much more conservative. Endoscopic assistant, uh, I like this approach. I can use the fiber optic lights and magnification. Uh, here's an example. This is a photograph I took. Uh, showing the nerves and the arteries that we can identify and avoid and just get to the muscles and the extra skin. Now, for example, here's a guy, good looking, big blue eyes, but his brows are so darn low you can hardly see them. Conservative lifting for men, okay, just to elevate them, you can see his big blue eyes a lot easier. So I'm much more conservative in men, but still sometimes we do them. Now again, just keep in mind, here's another celebrity. I'm much more likely to be conservative in the male because that low horizontal brow can be attractive. Now, um, even in a guy though, if it's too low or excess, people tend to look tired. So here's a guy, again, conservative eleva elevation for, for a guy. Conservative brow. Now, one of my most popular ways to do this is through an incision in the hair of the temple. Here's a gal, good looking, really nice skin, heavy eyelids, or I should say excess eyelids. So I did her upper lids and conservative brow elevation. So if we, we go from there to there. So it can be very powerful, just working on that upper third of the face with small incisions conservatively. Um, again, here's, <laughs> this is not my patient. So you can see that I'm much more likely to let a guy have a heavy, low horizontal brow than a man. But for a woman, we like to see that full upper lid with a gentle slope, okay, going laterally, or we say, or we say towards the ear, or laterally. Uh, and again, for a woman of almost any ethnicity, uh, that full upper lid with a gentle slope outward is very attractive. So here's a gal who just felt like her eyes are tired. She's a good-looking gal from a Scandinavian country. Very conservative addressing of the upper lids, done in the office. 
just gives her a brighter look. She didn't want her lower lids done. Here's a guy who's a model. His manager told him you would get more work if you showed off your creases. So he had a very conservative blepharoplasty done in the office just to show off the creases. So that's addressing the skin. What about the fat compartments? The fat around the eye, around the eyelids and eyeballs, very important. We treat it judiciously. Here's a guy, a young guy. Some families, you can almost tell when the kids are running around that one day they're going, they're going to want a lower blepharoplasty because sometimes the kids have these pouches. It's just the fat is held in place by a membrane. It's called the orbital septum. In some families, that septum is just kind of thin and weak, and the fat starts to push out. And this is this guy. He's a good-looking guy, uh, but he has those pouches. So for a guy like he, for a guy like him, I go inside the lower lid. He didn't need any skin removed, but there's he, this guy after about four or five days of conservative lower lid fat repositioning and sculpting and some removal. Here's a gal again, similar thing. She thought she had a lot of extra skin. In fact, she came in and she said, can you take this extra skin away from my lower lids? I said, you don't have extra skin. We just need to reposition the fat, strengthen the compartment, move some things around. So that's lower lid blepharoplasty done right in the office, going on the inside. No outside scars. Here's a guy, an older guy, profound lower lid pouches, similar thing. We can could, we could do this in the office, we can do this at the surgery center. Here's a gal who had a little bit of extra lower lid skin. She had some extra uh, eyelid skin in the upper lids. So, starting to get the idea about what I mean by conservative eyelid tucks, blepharoplasty done in the office or surgery center. Here's a gal with lower lid pouches. Didn't want filler, she wanted a more permanent treatment. Going on the inside. Here's an older gal uh, with redundant eyelid skin and pouches, conservative upper and lower blepharoplasty. Okay, starting to get the idea. Now, here's a gal with more profound lower lid pouches, and she also had weak suspensory ligaments in the lateral lids. So that's called the candopexy when we strengthen that, or candoplasty. So this, she had some other work done, so we did it at the surgery center. But that can make a dramatic difference. Okay, starting to get the idea, conservative, repositioning of the fat, addressing the skin when we need it. For the upper lids, it's mostly the skin. For the lower lids, it's mostly the fat. So, as I said, one of the ways we get to the fat, get to the, yes, we get to the fat of the lower lids is coming on the inside. As I, remember as I said about the axis incisions for mini lifts? If we don't need to remove skin, we don't always have to make an incision on the outside. Why not just go inside where the fat is? No scars. So here's a gal uh, who was bothered by the lower lid pouches, same type of thing, conservative lower lid blepharoplasty. And here's a diagram of the suspensory ligaments, right? I showed for that older gal with the profound changes. This is showing a strengthening procedure, cantopexy. Here's a guy with redundant skin of his upper lids and kind of loose lower lids, conservative blepharoplasty, upper and lower lid. Okay, I don't want to bore you, but I do want to give you some idea. Now here's a gal, nice skin, good looking, heavy lids, kind of heavy brows, and there she is, mini incisions up in the scalp through the temple, periorbital rejuvenation. So I talked about the upper third of the face, right, the eyelids, the brows, a little bit about the forehead. What about the mid face, the cheeks? Volume is so important. More than extra skin, more than drooping skin, volume is so important. Here's where I do more fillers, more fat grafting, right? Male models, female models, everybody wants high cheekbones and well-defined, uh, what I call the arc of beauty, the arch of beauty here. Everybody, all those models need well-defined projecting points. Underlying foundation, sometimes we reposition tissue in the mid-face. Uh, and of course, uh, surrounding tissue and support is very important. A lot of these changes are predictable. As we deflate, as we lose volume in the mid-face, it allows gravity to pull down. So, keep in mind, there's three parts to the triangle, and I hope before you leave tonight, you're gonna keep in mind everybody gets a custom designed, designed approach, and you're gonna think of the three different parts of the triangle that we address during consultation. Okay, facial rejuvenation. Volume replacement is so important for the mid-face. Keep in mind grape and raisin. So, 
As I said, volume is so important, but we need to look at those other factors as well. Should we lift? Should we reposition? We need to look at the adjacent structures, but primarily I look at volume. So, uh, in all ethnicities, it's that arc of beauty. We've got to have high cheekbones for men and women, the lateral brow. And you can, if you flip through the Glamour magazines, part of the way you, tell, you can tell is where the light reflects. That's all, that's, we want those light reflections at the tip of the nose for high cheekbones and the arc of beauty, no matter what your ethnicity is, etc. And of course, every customer deserves a custom designed approach. Um, we oftentimes get to the mid face through very short incisions because we're not going to remove a lot of skin. Sometimes I make these up in the hair, sometimes I hug the so called temporal tuft. In women, in men, we call it the sideburn. Now, I want to compare these short incisions and I wanted to show you what a more traditional or older style facelift incision would be. So, here's a slide just showing oftentimes what I do. I'll make a short incision in the temple, I'll hug the, the crease in front of the ear, I'll hug the temple tuft of hair. Now, that's a more traditional facelift incision. They're just longer incisions if I have to reposition or remove lots of skin. So, Again, custom design approach. If you need a short scar, we do the short scar. If you need a long scar, we're going to talk about that. We do what we need to do. Nothing, we, we do just what we need. Nothing more, nothing less. And we talk about that ahead of time. So here are some exa here's, a, here's an example of a gal who wanted and needed more soft, to more soft tissue repositioning. And she had a great hairstyle for it for more of a total facial rejuvenation. Now here's a gal who had lots of redundant skin. She needed a more traditional approach, more for the neck and cheeks and jowls. So starting to get the idea, longer incisions, perhaps more powerful, shorter incisions, mini lips, okay? Here's another example, lacks tissues in the jowls and the neck and the cheeks. And there she is, crisper, cleaner uh, lines. And there she is, you can see kind of healing incisions that hug the ears. Now here's a gal, with more profound changes. Now, you can, when you look at her, try to, try to tell or try to notice that she's a little bit deflated. So after conservative soft tissue repositioning and revolumizing, you can, you can see what I mean more of volumetric re restoration. Okay, try to see, do you kind of get the idea that she's projecting more in all dimensions? Okay, so before I go on, or before I leave the mid-face, sometimes people come in, especially women, not so many men, they come in and they ask about the pouches that they see in the morning kind of under their cheekbones. That's male or edema. When someone comes in and says, Doctor, they're there in the morning, but as the day wears on and I tend to have my coffee, it goes away. Can you do an operation? We need to be very careful about that because it's, it's part of the fluid cycle. So our primary treatment is not surgery. If someone has surgery around the mid-face or eyelids, we can affect that, but the primary treatment is not, it's not surgical. Okay, so I talked about eyelids, I talked about the mid-face, I want to talk a little bit about the lower third of the face, and that will probably be about the time we start to wear people out. So let's talk about the natural neck lift. The natural neck lift is a system of careful analysis evaluating appearance, anatomy, and goals with a custom design approach. We need to look at the anatomy of the neck, of course. There is fat in the neck, there's muscle, there's skin, there's bone and cartilage, etc. The first way that I do the natural neck lift, of course, is with skin care and the Botox that I showed before, right? With someone has, when someone has minimal platysmal banding, that can be very helpful. Skin care, moisturizers, Botox. Now, what about if there's excess fat? The way I do liposuction for the cervical area and the submental area, I make a little incision in the crease of the neck, excuse me, crease of the chin. About 90% of Americans that I meet already have a scar on the chin. Their little brother pushed them down the stairs, or they tripped on the curb, or they fell from their bike, or something like that. The second and third, <coughs> excuse me, places I make the incision are where the earlobe meets the cheek on each side. So a little incision where the earlobe meets the cheek, and one under the chin, and that, that way I get access. Now, I want to show you some examples of natural neck lifts done with just liposuction in the office. So, here's a gal with, remember, custom designed approach. Here's a gal 
Good skin, relatively young, with extra fat. Okay? So here she is, natural neck lift with just liposuction. And I think there's an improvement in contour. But she did not have extra skin. Now when there is extra skin, we need to make an incision. Because when there's extra skin, liposuction is not going to do the trick. It's not going to, we can get some change of redistributing the skin, but it's not the primary treatment. So here's a gal who has a little bit of extra fat, but she has some extra skin. So I make an incision as well as removing some fat, tighten the muscles a little bit, firm up the skin, and there's the natural neck of fur done in the office. Here's a gal with some jowling and extra tissue in the submentum. This gal would likely be unhappy or less than delighted if I just did liposuction. She needs soft tissue repositioning, same type of thing. In the office, short scar with sedation and numbing. Okay, starting to get the idea? Now, here's a gal with some fat, but she's got extra skin, and she elected to have something done with anesthesia. So, custom designed approach, right? People get what they need and want. Her husband took that photo, and he took the photo afterwards. See the incision? Hugging, hugging around the ear. Now, here's a gal with a little more profound change, uh, but she was done in the office just because that's what she wanted. Uh, she wanted a crisper, cleaner neckline. So, you're probably going to get sick of hearing this, but every customer deserves a custom design approach. Okay? I'll show a few more slides. I think we're rounding third base. Is that okay? Okay, now here's a gal. Good looking facial structure, but you can tell. Doesn't she look a little bit deflated? So, we can treat with some volumizing her own, her own fat, we did fat grafting, surgical positioning of the soft tissues and a little bit of skin care for the natural neck lift. Start to get the idea? Done in the office. Uh, here's a gal, I think we also did this gal, yes we did this gal in the office. Soft tissue repositioning, etc. Mostly skin, a little bit of fat. Now, um, the reason why I show this drawing of the horse, remember I talked about we've got to go layer by layer, step by step. We talked oh. about the skin, I've talked about the fat. Does anybody know uh, what the platysmal muscle is in the horse or whatever? You know what it is? Yeah. What is it? It's the one that allows them to shake their heads. What, it's right here. Well, it, it's, it's the muscle that lets them shiver. Yeah. So in, in our species, it goes from the mandible and it stops at the clavicles. In the horse, it runs two-thirds of the way down the body and it allows them to shiver. So in our species, it's like the appendix. It's just vestigial. It has no other use except to give plastic surgeons work, So, which, which we're very grateful for. So remember I said custom design approach? We've got to treat the skin. If the skin needs treatment, we've got to treat the fat. If the fat needs treatment, if it's the muscle, well then, if all I did was liposuction, then we'd have too many unhappy patients, and we want 100% delighted patients. So, for people with a loose platysma, they get a platysma plasty. There can be different approaches to this. That's something that we talk about in consultation. So here's a gal, you can't really tell the picture, but I, but take my word for it, she had a loose muscle, so she gets a platysma plasty for the natural neck lift. And there she is afterward. Here's a gal with profound changes in her platysma and some loose skin, so she gets a platysmoplasty for the natural neck lift, etc. For guys, same type of thing. He wanted improvement in his jowls and in his neck. Here's a guy who wanted some facial rejuvenation in addition to the neck rejuvenation, so he got a little longer incision. Starting to get the idea. Every customer deserves a custom designed approach. Now, what's a direct neck lift? A direct neck lift is a procedure we do in the office typically. When someone says they don't mind a scar underneath their chin in the submental area, they just want the skin removed. Some people call this a waddleectomy or the turkeyectomy. So she had a direct neck lift and we just remove that skin and tighten up. Similar thing, here's a direct neck lift done in the office under local. So here's a different, in a guy, here's a different type of uh, natural neck He had just that kind of waddle. He wanted that waddle like to me. So, I'm going to show a few more slides for a lower third of the facial rejuvenation and then I think I'm going to invite everybody to come back upstairs. 
So, when I talk about the foundation, that's things like the chin, the jaw, the nose, sometimes the forehead, or the eyebrow bones, etc. So, in the ears. Here's a pretty gal who came in and said she wanted kind of an aggressive rhinoplasty. I said, why don't we do something very conservative, but let's look at your chin, maybe bring that forward a little bit and do some submental liposuction. Okay, so what we're aiming for is balance and symmetry and harmony. Here's a guy who, really smart, great job, but he just felt like he never really had a chin or neck in his life. It's not because he's old, he just never had it. So for him, custom designed approach, I went inside the lower lip, we brought his chin forward, I made those three little incisions for liposuction, one in the submental crease, one where each earlobe meets the cheek, for the natural neck lift. So there he is. So, I think at this point, we've got about an hour. Okay, just very briefly, I just want to talk about body contouring. There's the open closed approach for body contouring. Essentially, the open approach is where we make incisions to remove big blocks of skin and fat. Those things are hard to do in the office. We can make, we can do things like tummy tucks, buttock lifts, thigh lifts. The closed approach to body contouring is liposuction, where I make really little incisions and I put in a tube. It's called a cannula, and I vacuum out fat and I can mold and shape and tailor as I go. There are actually state regulations. We can do, I think it's about 1,500 to 1,800 cc's we can do in the office under local. So same type of thing. You come in and take a pill, and then we numb you up, then we numb up the fat. We can do liposuction that way. I think it's up to 5,000 cc's can be done at the surgery center. Over 5,000, I think it requires an overnight stay. So there's the closed approach, which is essentially liposuction. The open approach to body contouring is where I make big incisions to remove the big blocks of skin and fat. So I think at this point, we can save body contouring in the office and in the surgery center and hospital for another night. So thank you very much for coming. We're, we're all, you're all welcome to come upstairs and have some more refreshments. Thank you so very much. And uh, we have some time for, time for questions upstairs. And let's see, there is Heather. Heather, I think, don't people get a cosmetic consultation if they haven't been to the office before? I think it's courtesy. Oh, let me just tell you one more thing. We have the Vector. It's a six camera photo system connected to the computer and you can see yourself in three dimensions and we can rotate you and turn you upside down and turn you inside out. No, I'm just kidding about that part. But we can do some conservative surgical sculpting to give you an idea of things that we talk about. So I think Heather can tell you, if you haven't come to the office before and you, for an aesthetic consultation, cosmetic stuff, please get a card. If you're hungry and thirsty, I hope everybody is. Jerrica, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Is Ariana here? Ariana, thank you. Come say hi to the gang. Come have some more food and drink. Thanks very much for coming.